Hey everybody, Green Films Official here. Now today I'm going to be analyzing a film that really means a lot to me and has inspired me a lot throughout the years and a film I've seen countless times. The film in question is Hunt for the Wilder People and in particular I will be focusing on how it deals with themes of institutional and familial power. Now, before I get into the analysis, I just want to apologize in advance for the quality of some of the film clips included in this video. For whatever reason, clips from this movie that are relevant to this analysis are kind of difficult to find on YouTube, so I resorted to my good old friend ClickView. Not that the ClickView quality is horrible, but if the quality seems not as good in some places, it's because I got it from there. I hope you understand, it was literally the best I could do to get some of these clips, but with that out of the way, I hope you also enjoy the analysis. <laughs> Hunt for the Wilder People is an adventure comedy film that was released on the 31st of March 2016. It was directed by Taika Waititi and stars Julian Dennison, Sam Neill, Rima Te Waeda, and it also stars Rachel House and Oscar Keitley. Based on the Barry Crump novel Wild Pork and Watercress, the plot is centered around Ricky Baker, a delinquent who is adopted by the Faulkner couple, consisting of Bella and Hector, the latter of which Ricky likes to call uncle. After Bella dies of a heart attack, Ricky runs away into the wild, quickly joined by Hector. A national manhunt ensues after Hector is falsely accused of molesting Ricky, and now the two are forced to band together and put their differences aside in order to survive the wilderness. Despite being a comedy, Hunt for the Wilder People can be pretty emotional at points, and one of the things that makes it impactful is how it explores the theme of power, more specifically institutional power and how it can both protect and punish. Power can enhance a person's life or diminish it, depending on how much control we have over the paths we take. An imbalance in this control, where decisions, actions, rules, and expectations are imposed on us, is disempowering. In this film, the institutional power lies in the police and the welfare agencies. Ricky must do as the world expects or the consequences will further disempower him. Ricky is oppressed by the legal system, who threatens him with incarceration for his actions. Not only has he been failed by the education system, but he has also been failed by the legal system. The child welfare services seem to have very little interest in providing a good outcome for Ricky and seem more interested in judging him, uh, deriding him as he has dropped off at his new foster home in the film's opening scene, and describing him as a shocker as they hastily retreat. Ricky grows to think of the world as this cold and uncaring place that hates him or something, a mindset that is certainly not helped by people like Paula Hall, the film's main antagonist. Ricky, this is your new home. Real piece of work, this one. Ricky! There's no one else who wants you, okay? Now, Ricky, you know what the alternative is, don't you? Eh? Ricky is shown to be stereotyped by Paula, who views him as nothing more than a rebellious kid who needs to be punished, rather than as someone who desperately needs the government's help. Paula uses everything Ricky does against him, and as such, his reputation for rebellion follows him everywhere. Apparently he's a bit of a handful, real bad egg. I mean, if you look in his file, you'll see that for yourself. We're talking disobedience, stealing, spitting, running away, throwing rocks, kicking stuff, defacing stuff, burning stuff. Loitering and graffiti, and that's just the stuff we know about. But hopefully a uh, change in scene will help straighten him out. She uses punitive and hurtful language to describe him to others, even when he's right there. She describes herself as the Terminator to Ricky Sarah Connor to him in one scene. Her interests lie in punishment, not in educational nurture. Even so, Paula, he's just a kid, right? He's alone in the bush, he's scared. Scared? No, no, he's not, he's not a scared little kid. He's a spanner in the works, and I'm the mechanic who's going to take that spanner and put him back in the toolbox okay, so. where he belongs. Hunt for the World of People is about many things, but primarily it's about Ricky. We see things through his perspective, and the soundtrack has a lot of modern music that someone like Ricky would enjoy, both of which give us a feel for who Ricky is as a person. It also has a fast-paced tone and uses quick camera and editing techniques in order to convey Ricky's energy and train of thought. It's a very personal film, really. Ricky experiences a lot of prejudice and neglect, and beyond the manhunt, the film is about the ways he deals with and stands against it. Acts of rebellion are a way in which the disempowered can assert some level of control over their lives, but as you might expect, 
this rebellion comes at a cost. Threat of removal and detention is ubiquitous and drives the narrative of the film. Feeling forced into his new foster home, Ricky runs away from the house each night, but later Bella starts to grow on him and he feels a connection with her. Ricky Baker, ah, uh, 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 Ricky Baker. Ricky is later advised that he will be taken away from his new home following his foster mother's sudden death, a prospect that causes him to flee into the wilderness. Ricky is a delinquent who wants to rebel against the enforced law and order of general society because of the ways the system has failed him in the past, in a way that is somewhat detached from reality. I didn't choose the skunk slime. The skunk slime chose me. Ricky, stop. Stop! Ah! This is because of his lack of education due to constantly being arrested and locked up in a detention center. This is prevalent in the film's second half, where Ricky starts acting out his view of a typical gangster, not fully understanding the weight of the situation he and Hector are in. He views the manhunt as a sort of game in a way. We need more guns. Oh, what am I gonna do? Hand grenades. Thank you, gotta thank Maybe a rocket launcher. <gasps> oh no. Ninjas. <gasps> Uh-oh. Might as well play it to the end, what do you reckon? You mean, have a shootout, and then when we've got no bullets, run out and say, freedom, and then die in a blaze of glory? No, I actually meant that we run out of petrol. Oh. Well, I'm dying in a blaze of glory. <laughs> Ultimately, in the end, Ricky learns to protest against the corrupt systems oppressing him through more noble means, after accepting that he may have gone too far. Early on in the film, he ends up burning down a barn in an attempt to fake his death, and during the film's climax, he even tries to drive away from numerous police cars with Hector, causing several accidents along the way. After this, he accepts he went too far and tells Hector, I just got carried away being an outlaw. Had too much fun. And with that, he decides to go on a more peaceful walk with Hector in search of a bird initially believed to be extinct. It's important to note how this film showcases the power of family, and more importantly, family's power to reset a wayward path. Not only does Ricky receive unwavering support from his strong mother figure, but when needed, his reluctant father figure comes to the fore. Because his birth mother abandoned him, he finds comfort in his new foster mother. He initially wants to run away from his new home, but he ultimately decides to stay thanks to her. Not long after her son's death, he is told he will need to be removed from his new home, and a new foster family will need to be found, and as such, he decides to disappear into the woods with quote-unquote Uncle Hector. The power of family is transformative for him. The power of language is also an ongoing theme throughout the film. For Ricky, the use of haikus, short Japanese poems with only 17 syllables, helps him express himself. He shares multiple haikus throughout the film to either cope through various situations or simply just to share something of himself. Kingy, you wanker. You asshole. I hate you heaps. Please die soon in pain. That was called... Kingy, you wanker. Yeah, yeah, okay. It is also through the power of language and communication that Ricky not only has the ability to express himself, but to deeply affect those around him. He empathizes with Hector because he is similarly stereotyped by Paula and the outside world. They're gonna come for us. Yeah, please. Awesome. No, it's not awesome, Ricky. It's serious. Yeah, but no one got hurt. You're not dangerous. Yeah, well, I am to them. He shows his gruff and distant foster father that he can love and be loved at a point in the film where everyone seems to think he's some kind of pedophile and, as Ricky would put it, a molester. At the end of the film, Hector creates his own haiku as both a mark of respect and as a way of expressing his feelings for Ricky. Hey, wait on. Got something to say. <clears throat> Me and this fat kid we ran, we ate, and read books, and it was the best. Hunt for the Wilder People is great for so many reasons. It's filled with brilliant directing, hilarious comedy, and astonishing acting, and it's packed with personality and heart. But what elevates it to such a high level for me is how it integrates themes of institutional and familial power and the impact of both. 
Its central character is oppressed by a society that judges him, and a legal system that neglects to address the disadvantage he is experiencing and takes a punitive approach to his actions, when it's really not the best way to go about treating him. For all of Ricky's gangster talk, he shows a lot of compassion and understanding towards Hector's grief. Do you miss Auntie Bella? Shh. Yeah. You're still processing. You gotta do that when sad things happen. Process it. That's like when my mate Amber died. I processed that for ages. He even brings Bella's ashes with them so that they can spread them someplace nice. It's a classic don't judge a book by its cover story. The same applies to Hector. He's introduced as this scary and imposing man who doesn't care much for Ricky. But as the film goes on, he reveals himself to be a lot more compassionate. Beyond a few basics, people are not categorizable. As Shrek once said about ogres, People are like onions, and onions have layers. By viewing people in only one way without considering anything else, we dehumanize them. It's a very narrow-minded way of looking at the world that only leads to harm down the track. Instead of being dismissive towards kids like Ricky, we should try and nurture them. We shouldn't just write them off as troublesome delinquents. We should appeal to their inherent goodness and try to lead them down a better path. And that, my friends, is what makes Hunt for the Wilder People truly majestical. I hope you enjoyed this analysis of this utterly hilarious and moving film. If you did, why not leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already? Your support really helps out. And uh, I also have a letterbox you can check out. Link for that in is in the description below. And with all that being said, I hope to see you in the next one, people. Bye!